you probably doesn't need too much of an introduction, but I'm going to turn this over to Alex Snodgrass at this time and let him start to uh, show us some of the some of his own magic about bandsaws tonight. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I hope that uh, tonight can go nice and smooth. Um, what I'd like to do is go over um, <clears throat> a full resaw setup. Then I want to do a small blade setup. And then uh, to finish, I'm going to show you a simple bandsaw box that uh, isn't just a single drawer, it's also a hidden drawer. So we're going to do that. Um, we Obviously, we can't put it together, um, but I, I do want to show you how to cut it uh, so that it's easy to put together. Uh, I'm going to show you a brand new glue um, from uh, Type Bond that uh, makes this a breeze. Um, and before we get started, you're going to be able to rewatch this pretty much anytime that you want uh, on Bandsaw Life. If you have not uh, joined Bandsaw Life um, on YouTube, or you can go to bandsawlife.com um, and join through the link uh, on the website. Um, we will uh, have uh, not only that video up, but uh, so several other interviews as well as several other projects. Um, I'll show you a couple of them tonight uh, when we sit down at the end. Uh, that way you can uh, uh, kind of see what uh, may be coming up in the future. The other thing I want you all to uh, see, I'm sure you all have seen me do these boards at Woodcrafts almost all over uh, the U.S. from Seattle uh, to Arizona to uh, all the way, uh, I mean, just all up and down the East Coast. Um, I'm doing these classes at Woodcrafts, and I, I'm just I'm blown away by the classes that are being packed out. But Wayne and, and I have talked, and I would love to come out to Colorado and teach at every store, especially especially once this COVID thing is, is somewhat under control and everybody can get together. And uh, so be on the lookout for that. Wouldn't you agree, Wayne? Absolutely. And please feel free to express interest in that if you are interested in that and doing such a thing so that we can, you know, ga gauge that level of interest. All right. Now I'm going to change this to just... Uh, how do I, how do I just put, I hate to be, uh, you know, vain, but how do I just put this on myself? Because I want to be able to see what everyone else is seeing so that I can direct the camera properly. Is that possible? Or when you say you just want to see actually, yourself, I, I've got it. I figured it out, Wayne. That okay. one, uh, I, I, if I see full screen, then I can kind of see what everybody else is seeing and I can direct uh, exactly where I'm pointing to. Now, uh, we're going to start out by, uh, number one, uh, tonight I'm working with a 14-inch cast iron frame saw. I'm also going to be working with uh, my 24-inch uh, Powermatic over here, just as is kind of a backup. It is my favorite saw. My wife has accused me of cutting toothpicks on it. Um, it, it is just the coolest saw uh, to use in the shop. But First, let's start with a resaw setup. Um, first things first, unplug the saw. I'm gonna get that fence out of the way. We're gonna take the table insert and the table leveling pin out. Now, if you've lost your table leveling pin, just do what I do, because you end up sucking them up in the, in the dust collector. I just take a bolt, round it off, and what that pin is for is they actually drill it at a taper before they actually cut the groove in the table. That way, when you put the pin in, it keeps the table level, whether it gets hot or cold, warps. The other thing that I'm going to do, matter of fact, let's just tilt this down so that y'all can see exactly what I'm doing. You don't have to see my uh, face the whole time. I've taken the two knobs off the bottom of the table. The reason being... Whenever I do a full setup, I find it a lot easier to get the table out of the way. Most saws, you can take those two knobs off. Sometimes it's a couple of bolts, 
Sometimes it's a couple of other things. But most saws, you're able to take that table off so that you can see what that uh, guide setup is under the table as well as the top. And when they're working together, when you can see both of them working together, it's a lot easier to set this up. So we've got the table out of the way. Let's take that blade off the saw. Now I'll show you how to fold that blade when we sit down for questions. Um, uh, there are several ways of doing it. I'm going to show you the easiest way that I know how. Now, I generally like to keep magnets on my band saws so that I can attach all my wrenches right to the saw. Makes it a lot easier to find all the tools. The other thing that I like to use these magnets for is you'll notice this pencil. I've taken a little bit of heat shrink, put the magnet on it. That way, whenever I need a pencil, every machine in my shop has one of those pencils. I'm gonna back away every guide on this saw because we wanna go through a full tune-up of this saw from beginning to end. Then I'm going to back away my thrust bearings, both upper and lower. I'm also going to open the outside bearing and the inside bearing, both top and bottom, because again, I want you all to see every adjustment. I don't want you to think there's any smoke and mirrors here. I want to make sure that everyone sees all six steps that it's going to take to get this resole set up just perfect. So we've got everything backed away. We're ready for step number one. And I feel that about 90% of all drift on a bandsaw comes from doing step number one incorrectly. We'll raise that up just a little bit because we can still see that lower guide. And step number one is installing the blade. Now, one of the biggest problems I've run into over the years is everyone has told me that they've always been told that the bandsaw blade should be in the center of the wheel. I think that's wrong and I'll explain why. Most of you know that a bandsaw wheel has a crown from front to back. So if you've got a crowned wheel and a flat blade and you center the blade right in the middle of the wheel, where's all the tension and rigidity on that blade? Right in the middle of the blade, essentially giving it a pivot point. And when you cut, Everybody wonders why it veers off in one direction or the other. All the tension's in the wrong spot. What we want to do is back that blade up so that the deepest part of the gullet is right in the center of the wheel. The gullet is the space in between the teeth. It's the wheelbarrow that carries the dust out of the wood. By putting the deepest part of the gullet right in the center, we're putting all the tension and rigidity at the front of the blade, not the middle of the blade. And the only thing that these side guides have to do is to prevent the back edge from fishtailing, which is a whole lot easier than trying to force that front edge where you want it to go. And we're also using leverage, and everybody knows leverage beats force every time. So instead of trying to force that blade where you want it to go, we're actually using leverage to direct where that blade goes. So step number one is done, deepest part of the gullet, center of the wheel. Now, that being said, I get a lot of people that say, well, the blade is further ahead on the bottom wheel than it is on the top. It has to be. And the reason that I say that, if, if you follow guidelines of coplanar, you are messing with fire. And the reason that I say that, if the blade is not further on the bottom, further forward on the bottom than the top, well, that means when you cut a tall piece of wood, if it touches the top before it touches the bottom, what do you think that piece of wood is going to do? It's going to jerk all up into the saw. So that's why you never want to mess with that bottom wheel adjustment unless you talk with your manufacturer. And by all means, don't go through the coplanar theory. It does not work, and it's extremely dangerous. Alex, if I could kiss you right now, I would. Please don't. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes, sir. Agreed. Uh, yeah, that, it is, that is the biggest um, problem I have seen in years 
of, you know, it's got to be coplanar. It's so dangerous not not to uh, have that forward just a little bit on the bottom. So Well, I'll, I'll just kick in and say this, that we have never seen a bandsaw that has an issue with with being out of plane until somebody attempts to adjust the lower wheel. And at that point in time, then we have some serious issues that we have to get involved with the manufacturer at that point. And I could, uh, if we had enough time, <clears throat> I could prove it to you. And the reason I say that is I can move this blade forward all the way on the top. And you can all can try this on your own, Saul. Move the blade forward to where the teeth are right at the tip. Notice where the blade is at the bottom. When you move the blade forward on the top, the blade will not move forward on the bottom. The blade is set up from the factory so that it always stays in the same place at the bottom. So please don't mess with that bottom. So, so step number one is done. Deepest part of the gullet, center of the wheel. Step two, tension. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of folks make is they try to check tension over here on the right-hand side. Don't do that. Open up your door. I'm gonna tilt this just a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. Open up your door. Always lay your finger right here on top of this guard. That way you have a consistent distance from the wheel. And when you push, shouldn't be able to get much more than about a quarter of an inch without turning your finger wider or not. The reason that I don't like to use the gauge that's here in the back, they're not exactly accurate. Um, what they do from the factory is they take a perfect length blade or string or whatever it is that they're measuring uh, that they need for that saw. And the problem is when they weld a blade, they have to tooth match. And when you tooth match, the blade ends up a little short or a little long. Let's say they're off by an eighth of an inch and that's being extremely generous. Most of the time it's more like three eighths or even a half inch sometimes. Uh, but if it's off by an eighth of an inch, that means this gauge in the back is off by a quarter of an inch because there are two sides to the blade. So great starting point, don't trust them. Always check on the inside because there's no resistance down the left-hand side. Down the right-hand side, you have guard, guide, table, insert, all of that uh, giving the blade resistance. So it's clear and free. And when you lay your finger on top of this, gate, this guard, you'll always have that consist consistent distance and a consistent feel. So just about a quarter of an inch pushing on it lightly. So we've got step two done. Step three. Now, step three, pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to move the side guides front to back so that the front edge is just behind the deepest part of the gullet. Now, you don't want to put these side guides into the gullet, because if you do, you're going to flatten the teeth out. The moment you flatten the teeth out, it's going to seek the easiest route because it's basically become a knife edge. So we want to bring those side guides just behind the deepest part of the gullet, both top and bottom. Pretty simple. Step four. Now, step four, I think, is almost as critical as where that blade rides on the wheel and that is our thrust bearings. We want those thrust bearings close, but not so close that they touch or turn before you begin to cut. If they're touching or turning before you begin to cut, what you're doing is you're pushing on the back edge of the blade, causing that front to tweak one way or the other, generally the second reason you're gonna get drift. So we'll just bring that thrust bearing right up close. Now you'll notice that I check this by rotating the blade. You can see, that that bearing doesn't turn when I rotate the blade, but this is all that it takes to make that thrust bearing turn. Y'all know that I can't feel real good on the backs of my fingers, but that's all the pressure it takes to make that thrust bearing turn. Essentially, the moment you begin to cut, the bearing should begin to turn or spin. The moment you stop cutting, it should slow and stop turning. We'll do the same thing underneath. Now, if I've done this the proper way, I should be able to touch right here in the center with as little as a fingernail. They should both turn, which they do. When I rotate the wheel, neither of them should turn. We can see the top one's got just a little turn. So I'm gonna back that off just a smidge. 
Now we don't have any turn. Now they both turn. We've got step four done. All the way up to step five. Now step five, um, for years, everybody's been told get feeler gauges or duct tape or anything you can to get them as close as possible because you're trying to force the blade where you want it to go. Here's the problem. We're dealing with a blade that has been yielded. Fancy word for being bent. Every tooth has been bent. And anytime you put friction or heat in the body of the blade, whether it's on the tooth or not, those teeth want to come back to the original state. So by keeping the side guides close, but not so close that they turn or create friction or heat constantly, you're going to get a much longer life out of your blade. And remember, we're using leverage, not force, so we don't have to have them so close. So I basically just run mine up as close as I can, leave just a little bit of daylight between the blade and the guide. And when I rotate the wheel, they should not turn. If they turn, you're way too close. Now, if the side guides turn, say occasionally, just from maybe a little bit of vibration, not gonna hurt a thing. You can see I've got a little bit of movement here. We'll do the same thing underneath. By the way, we're going to prove that this is going to work. And let's see here. Let me get this snugged up. A little close on that outside piece. Got a little movement there, a little movement there. We're ready for step number six. And by the way, if you want to remember, yes. I'm sorry, before you move on, we did have a couple of questions. Um, let, me, let me just say this real quick. If y'all don't remember all those steps, it's okay. Go to Instagram at alexsnodgrass.com. You can print all those steps out. That way you can stick them right to the inside of your door. You'll never forget how to tune it up. Sorry, Wayne, go ahead, buddy. Very good. The first one was, when you're talking about tension, you mentioned pushing on the inside edge about a quarter of an inch. Uh, would you hold that same for roughly all blades, let's say a quarter of an inch blade, as well as a three quarter of an inch blade? Or do you vary that based off the blade size? Actually, about the only blade that I will make a little bit less is the blade that I'm going to use a little bit later. And that is a one eighth inch blade. A one eighth inch blade, uh, if you over tighten it, it has a real bad problem of eloping. Basically, it spreads at the tooth and not the body. So it's like trying to keep a string on the wheel. So an eighth inch blade, you want to back off just a little bit, uh, maybe three eighths of an inch. Uh, but other than that, most of them are going to be right at about a quarter of an inch, pushing on it lightly. Um, and, and once you uh, cut with a blade and you kind of know it is just the perfect tension, make sure you stop the saw and check it. That way you can kind of get that consistent feeling. It's like anything else. If you do it enough, you will uh, uh, figure out exactly where you want that tension. And, and the second question that was posed was, how does one move the blade back and forth on the upper wheel? Well, anytime that you have an adjustment, uh, most saws are on the back side. You have a, 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 a rod or a knob that sticks out and that actually angles the wheel. The only other saws that I've seen that are different, y'all see that old antique over there in the corner? That three-wheeler. Yeah, 12-inch 12, 12 sears. It's right in the middle. There's a slot in the middle, and when you tighten it, it moves the blade back, and when you loosen it, it moves the blade forward. So there's always going to be a way of tracking it. Um, and on three-wheel saws, I believe it is usually on the very bottom uh, side, uh, outside wheel. So uh, it, you just have to kind of figure out where that adjustment is, uh, look at your manufacturer specs, but there's always going to have to be a way of tracking a blade. The only saw that I've ever seen that has no tracking, it's, it's kind of automatic, it would be a 11-inch uh, Shopsmith. Um, and those have bearings on both sides so that it always pulls the blade back and rides against those bearings. Those are the questions we have for right now. Thank you, sir. Okay, no problem. All right, so we've got our first five steps. I told you there were six. 
six involves the table. So let's get that table reinstalled. And by the way, we're gonna cut a, a piece of seven inch cherry just to prove that this will work. Now, as I install the table, I want you all to know the blade that I'm using tonight is a 3 8 inch Greenwood blade uh, by Carter Products. Um, Carter makes uh, standard blades, uh, which I'll use in the eighth inch. This 3 8 inch Greenwood, Greenwood blade, the best blade I have used, period. Um, we helped, uh, helped them develop this a few years back. And what we did was most blades are 25 thousandths thick. A Greenwood blade has 32 thousandths thick teeth. And what that does is it gives you just a little bit wider curve, uh, not a whole lot, what, seven thousandths. Um, but what it does is it actually, since the tooth is thicker, it stays set longer. So it will cut Greenwood, it'll cut dry wood. And my favorite thing about this particular 3 8 inch blade, I can run this on my 14 inch saw, I can run this on my 24 inch saw, and I can resaw to the full capacity, yet a 3 8 will turn within two inches. So it's an extremely, um, uh, just a blade that is a great combo blade. Now the blade that I keep on this saw most of the time, if you do have a saw that is uh, say uh, 18 inches or larger, then use a 5 8 inch. Now I will also tell you that if you put a 5 8 inch on there, you will not turn it. Um, it takes a country mile to turn it. Um, but uh, 3 8 inch, absolutely a perfect combo blade. So um, I can resaw 12 inch capacity with this particular blade on this saw and do so at the shows every weekend. Now, we've got our table tight, put our leveling pin back in, take our table insert, drop that back into place, plug our saw back in. Now, before you do anything, you want to make sure that table is level. If it's not level, everything's going to come out a little tapered, and especially when you get into the thicker material, the takes just a little bit off and it's really tapered. So we want to make sure that the table is level. And I found a real simple way of doing that. Everybody's got a piece of one by four or two by four in your shop. Take a piece about the length of your table, okay? Or the width of your table. And what we want to do, I'm going to bring this down just above our work. we we'll plug back in. I'm going to turn my dust collector on. Now, what we want to do is it's been joined on both sides already for you, so we know it's basically parallel. We want to set that flat on the table and make a simple cut. Sorry, I didn't get my insert in there very tight, did I? Then simply flip it over, bring it around back. If the blade will go back into that cut, I know I'm level across the whole surface of the table, not just up one side or the other. Very easy way of making sure your table is good and square for your blade. Now, next, I want to set my fence. Now, if you have a, a T fence, they're great, uh, especially for being uh, repeatable. Uh, if not, a simple little add on is a mag fence. Basically, we'll set that right here. I'm going to set it for about a quarter of an inch. But when you set it, how do you know that you're square to the blade this way? Well, that's where these come in handy. If you've never used a FAST, the FAST is a fence alignment system tool. I invented these a few years back. And you'll notice, I'll put it up close. It has a groove for the offset of the teeth, a magnet for the body of the blade, and the way I made this is I took a small magnet and a steel ruler, so you can do it that way as well. We simply drop it right onto the blade, and now I can see exactly where square is to the blade. If I want to double check, these come in a pack of five. I like to keep some on the router table, some on the saws, but at least two on the bandsaw. Let's say I wanted to set it up for two inches. 
Well, then I would measure over two inches on the back. I would measure over two inches on the front. I know I'm square and I'm uh -huh. Now, I will also tell you, check your fence, your T-fence. If you're getting a cut and it's wavy, but it's straight, it's probably because your fence is out of square. It's trying to cut straight, but it keeps waving back into place. So check your T-squares. You'll be amazed at how far out it can be. But Wayne, did you say something? Well, I, I just said, ah, I was trying to understand the fast. And then when you showed the measurement, I, I got it. There was one question from earlier, and sure. that was about the, your blade selection. And that was, do you alter the number of teeth per inch depending on the type of material that you are cutting? Or do you, you know, kind of stick with that same type of blade? Uh, if you're cutting with the greenwood blades, they only come in uh, three teeth per inch. Uh, that's that is their limit. Now, if I was doing some more, some uh, kind of more refined work, I was dealing with some extremely soft material, then I just go to a standard blade, four teeth per inch, um, to get a, a nice resaw. I don't ever really go over four teeth per inch unless it is with the one eighth inch blade, and there's no way to get a one eighth inch blade in anything less than 14 teeth per inch. Uh, the reason being is uh, the gullets get too large, the blade gets too weak, and basically breaks very easily. Uh, but other than that, I really don't go over 14 per inch on just about anything that I cut on a mansel. And, and the question was just asked, where do you get these wonderful tools? And of course, I would have a suggestion as to where, where one might shop for some of these things. Um, so I think that goes without saying. But but nevertheless, the uh, the fast pieces in particular are something that I'm not sure I've seen within our stores, but I, I'm certain I'm going to take a peek and, and see if those are available. Well, you know, uh, Wayne, uh, anything that we can do to help, I, I'm sure most of the Woodcrafts do sell Carter products. Um, and uh, by all means, uh, Bombard poor Wayne. Make sure that you get as many tools from him. Yes. All right. Now, we've got the fence square. We've got the guide set. So this thing should cut perfectly straight, right? Let's find out. Got a, about a seven-inch piece of cherry here. Now, something else I want everybody to keep in mind when you're resawing, whether it's short or long, look down that board. I want you all to notice this board has just a little bit, and I mean very slight, curve. You always want to put the outside of the curve against your fence. Reason being, if we were to turn it this way, as this got uh, closer to the curve, it would cup this way and seem to drift in. By keeping the outside curve against the fence, well, you can always follow that curve and keep that outside curve at that on that fence at the point of the cut. So always look down your board before you cut. So let's see what we've got here. Not only did we cut straight, we cut about as dead accurate as you can possibly get. Now, you can see that they are the exact same size on both sides. So if we tilt it this way, that skinny part will still be on the left-hand side. So I'm pretty sure we set it up properly. And before I take this off and show you the small blade, remember I said that that 3 8 inch blade could turn down to two inches? Well. Get that fence off.
I lied, it's an inch and three quarters. They really are a versatile blade. All right. Now next, I wanna show you some small blade setup. Uh, any questions while I'm changing this out, Wayne? It'd be a good time to uh, ask. We'll unplug our- there, 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 was, there was a question about your, um, your predilection to wearing safety glasses. You know what? Thank you. Uh, sometimes I get excited. Uh, I should have put them on before I cut that. Whoever that was, you're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and there was a comment that one of your slices was thicker than the other. Um, I agree that one of them was thicker than the other, but we did not necessarily set up the saw to be in the center of the board. That's did correct. We? No, we, we no, just I, sent we just I set it up to cut straight. Exactly, and it is it couldn't cut any straighter. And they're probably right. One might be just a little bit thicker than the other, but I can guarantee it's the same thickness at this end as it is this end. Yep. All right. Now, anytime that you want to use a blade that's quarter inch or less, then you don't want side guides. What we want is a blade stabilizer. Now, if you've never used a blade stabilizer, it's the only guide you have to use for quarter inch or smaller blades, and there are no guides under the table whatsoever. So what I'll do is we'll just back away those lower guides so that they're out of the picture completely. We'll get that blade off the saw. We've got it unplugged. Take those Carter guides out, and it fits right back in where those came out. Just snug that up, and I'm going to change to a 1 8 inch blade. Now, this is a standard 25 thousandths Accurite blade. Just that so the deepest part of the gullet is right at the center of the wheel. Just wanted to make sure we weren't going to over tighten that. Now, to give you an idea just how accurate blades are in length, I've got the proper tension on this eighth inch blade. It's a little bit lighter than the other, but I didn't have to change the adjustment. So that should tell you that there was a little bit of variance there. So the eighth inch is just a little bit longer than that three eighths was. So we've got our blade in place. I've backed away the lower guides. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna take that stabilizer and we're gonna bring it up to the back edge of that blade. And you'll notice I'm pushing the blade forward just about an eighth of an inch, spring loading the blade. So we'll spring load it. Now, I'm not sure whether y'all will be able to see this or not. I'm gonna back that away because apparently my vision is going because it was not in the middle of the wheel. There we go. That's a little bit better. Now, we've got the blade, deepest part of the gullet, center of the wheel, bring this up to the back edge. I'm gonna push that forward about an eighth of an inch and tighten it. Now the first time that I rotate this wheel, this blade is going to move forward the same amount that I pushed it forward with the stabilizer. So I'm going to use my thrust adjustment to bring the blade back so that the deepest part of the gullet is back in the center. That way the blade is sprung into the groove. How many of y'all have tried to cut into something and back out only to have the blade pop off the saw? Well, you don't have that problem as much anymore. Not that it can't happen. You catch a knot or something like that, it can pull that blade off, but it's much less likely. And I'm gonna show you that in the next cut that I do here. 
That's all there is to adjusting a quarter inch with smaller blade. Wouldn't that be nice? Plus, the blade never gets hot because it doesn't have side guides. So that means the blade's gonna last about three to four times longer because it never gets hot. And when I stop this, after doing this one cut, well, it's actually several cuts, I'll actually, once the blade stops completely, I'll reach up and feel it and see that there is absolutely no heat to the blade. And so what, what size blades do you use that for typically? A uh, quarter inch or smaller. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll use a piece of maple here. Plug our saw back in. We've got just a simple piece of maple. Now remember I said it's nice to be able to cut in and back out. Now we can. We sprung the blade into the groove, making it much tougher to pull off the saw. Not that it's impossible again, catch an otter, a splinter, or a groove, and pop off. Now the other thing you'll notice, even with this small of a blade, you don't normally see it turn that tight. Reason we can, no side guide. So that means the blade can actually flex and follow that corner around. You're going to get about half what you would normally get out of whatever blade you're trying to use. Not to mention they're a little bit more accurate. So anytime that you want to use quarter inch or smaller blades, switch to the stabilizer. It'll last a lot longer because it doesn't have the friction and heat. The blade has just stopped. You can see there's absolutely no heat there whatsoever. No way I could touch the back of my fingers with that blade. So um, that should kind of give you an idea of small blade setup. Any questions from here? Nope. Well, we've got the class going on then. All right. Now, what I want to do is we'll do uh, that bandsaw box that I, I told you here. One thing I do want to cover before we get into uh, the bandsaw box, actually two things. Uh, number one, I get a lot of folks that ask me about the spring back here. Should I change my spring? Well, you can change the spring to what we call a cobra coil, not because you absolutely have to. I mean, you could almost bottom this out and still get enough tension um, to get uh, on that blade. The issue being is the more this bottoms out, the less your blade, um, well, the more your blade has to stretch uh, to compensate for any vibration that's in that saw. Um, the only reason that I normally change these out to what we call a cobra coil. You'll notice it's about three quarters of an inch shorter. So that means I don't have to tighten or turn this knob quite so much to get the tension that I need. It also takes less lever action uh, to get uh, that tension up to the maximum. And it's a constant tension, not a um, softer tension where every time you hit something hard, you'll notice the blade kind of gives you that little whipple cut. Well, that Cobra coil gives you a little bit more rigidity in the blade. Now, the other thing that I want to do is when I do small work on a table like this, or even a table like this, we've got the insert, we've got the groove, we've got the miter gauge, all of those kind of in the way when you're trying to do some intricate work. So what I do Y'all know uh, good old dry erase boards. You can buy a, a two foot by three foot piece from Lowe's anytime you want for $6.49, I think it is. Now, um, I like this idea when someone showed it to me, the only issue is they were using double stick tape. And when you put double stick tape on a table, 
it makes it almost impossible to get back off. Plus, double stick tape has moisture in it, causes the table to rust. So what I do is I drill the corners out for a magnet. That way I can take my piece, drop it right down there on the table, keeps it solid. I've got a nice flat surface to work with. And uh, I've always got uh, something that I can get real accuracy out of because the slot is laying across the flattest part of the table. Okay. All right. Now, I've cut a blank out for our box. Again, for anybody that didn't see what we're going to do here, we've got a one drawer box with a hidden drawer in the back. So I've cut the outside shape. The first thing that we have to do to start this box is to cut the back off. Now, I've got this one set up for my small blade. I've got my uh, 14 inch saw or 24 inch saw set up for my resawing. So I'm gonna just do my resawing on the bigger saw. That way we stay accurate and I don't have to change back and forth in order to do this. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut the back off. And remember when you're doing this, always mark your pieces. It makes it a lot easier to put it back together. Um, a day is a terrible thing to waste. If you get them out of order or get them backwards and you can't quite figure it out, it's just a lot easier to mark some of these. So I know that I'm gonna use this as my back. So we'll just put a B, again, using pencil, a little sanding. So we'll cut that back off. So we we'll cut the back off. Next, I want to cut the inside of my drawer. But when you cut the inside of the drawer, don't just cut anywhere. Always cut with the grain. The reason we want to do that is when we close that gap up, it'll look more like a grain line of a cut line glued back together. And you can see that on this particular box. I don't think anybody can hardly tell where the glue line is. It's actually on this side, and I'll even put that up close so you can see that glue line is just about disappeared. way that I tend to mark my boxes is I will take so that I, I know I'm going to do a drawer shape the exact same size or same shape as the outside. I'll just take my pencil, just lay my finger up there. That way it gives me a guideline. To follow all the way around. leave a cut line on the bottom by allowing it to break through well it didn't actually cut in and kind of mess up my drawer something I'd have to cover up later and then we simply glue that back together and you can see that basically disappears there so now we've got the outside design of our box now next we need to do our drawer here now, normally, if I was just doing a single drawer, something that wasn't hidden, well, 
then I would cut the front and the back off, cut my drawer out, and I'd be done. But in this case, we're going to cut the front off first, cut our hidden drawer out of the back, and then cut the back off. That way, our outside is the exact same as the drawer. So first thing I need to do, since I know that this is the front, I'm going to put the F there. Cut the front off. Next, we go to do the back, and this is where it kind of gets uh, where you really want to make sure that you, you don't mix these up. We're going to cut the back here, and I just want a small enough drawer to just draw these two lines out here. And we'll make our drawer about that thing. Same theory, cut with the grain so that we can cover this up. Get to the end, let it break through. So now we've got our back drawer cut out. Then we're going to cut the back of the box off. So now we've got the front and the back cut off. And the last thing we have to do is to cut our drawer out of the top. The way that we do that, leave space. So if you got the bottom of the drawer. Now we've got our drawer. Let's just see how this lines up. We've got the back for our box. We've got the front. Now you can see we've got our drawer here, a space for our hidden drawer. And the last thing we have to do is the small drawer itself. And that doesn't get much easier. You just cut the front and the back off. Stand it up. Now, something you want to make sure you check is which way that drawer slides in there. Because you don't want to cut the bottom of the drawer out. So we know that it fits this way. We know that's the top of the drawer. Stand that up. Get rid of that. We've got the front and the back of that drawer put together. I'm gonna set all this stuff on the table. I'm going to cover a couple of things. We'll, I'll sit down with you um, and then we can answer some questions and finish up here. Turn our dust collector off. Lower 
that down just a little bit. Now I get to sit down, talk a little bit. All right. Now, like I was saying, sometimes it, it gets a little bit difficult to try to figure out which way this goes. You can always use your cut lines uh, to line everything back up. And no curve is ever going to be identical. So you can see now that door is perfect for the back. And as far as this goes, you can see that line that goes all the way down. Now we can match that up. And we know this end goes in first, just like that. So now we basically have the same box unfinished. Now, something that uh, uh, I use a lot um, is, if y'all have not gotten this, um, I, I'm sure that the woodcraft out there has it. It is Tight Bonds Fast Set. Absolutely love this glue for doing bandsaw boxes. It is, it is perfect for this. And just to kind of give you an idea how quick it will work, I'll put just a little bit in the cup here. Um, and I love those new pumps they've come out with. Saves me a ton of time. Um, and it's a little bit more accurate um, to get exactly what you need for glue. So we take this, I'm gonna just put those two pieces together. I'm gonna take a clamp. And what I'd like to do, I've got, I think, a stopwatch set up here. I'm gonna start it for five minutes, just to kind of give you an idea how fast this stuff sets. And the reason that I use uh, the glue and not the super glue. Uh, Type on makes a great super glue. The issue that I have with the super glue is it tends to soak into the wood and it makes it almost impossible to sand out, uh, to eliminate that, that uh, darker areas, almost like it's been uh, uh, varnished or something like that. Um, and with this, this uh, glue, it just completely disappears into the wood so that you never have to worry about, you know, trying to get it sanded out. It's not harder than the wood so that you don't end up with that kind of that bump that you get uh, with super glue. Um, the other thing that I like to do to finish these boxes is I like to flock the drawers. Now, flock, which uh, I know Woodcraft also carries, uh, flock is, is nothing more than a, a powdered felt, okay? I, uh, my, my wife is the one that uh, usually flocks the drawers. She's, she's very meticulous at it. I have to tape them up. Um, and what we found is if you'll tape the edges and you will paint the drawer and let it dry, let it completely dry one time. If you try to do this on the first pat, uh, first uh, uh, painting, what happens is you get kind of splotchy areas where the paint gets uh, sucked into the wood in some areas and dries quicker than the others. And we just use good old acrylic paint. Uh, you can buy this at pretty much any art, art store. Um, she uses just whatever color is close to the flock. And she paints the whole, the second time, she paints the whole inside of the drawer as thick as she can without it being runny. Then she takes the drawer, puts it into the bag and just shakes it vigorously. What this does is it embeds into the paint and gives you a perfect soft flock. And the cool thing about the paint, it's softer than the glue. So you get even more of a velvety finish. Um, and that paint really hides any imperfections uh, that are underneath the flock there. Now, last thing I'll, I'll tell you, when it comes to bandsaw boxes, don't get stuck uh, thinking that you can only get one drawer out. Just to kind of give you an idea, here's you another one. This, this one I messed up, so I always keep it around so that 
We've got one drawer, two drawers, and you can see where I messed up on this one, three, all out of the same piece of wood. So anytime that you're gonna do a box that has the same shape drawer as the outside design, why not make more than one? And then the last thing I'll show you here when it comes to these boxes, don't get stuck with just a drawer. Um, and the reason I say that, this is a, this is a piece, this of uh, a red cypress. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it came from Colorado. A customer of mine sent this to me. I love this box. I show it at most of the shows. This is what we call a pin box. Now, a pin box, simply lift the pin up, pull that out, and you've got a drawer. Well, then you may have a second drawer. Don't forget about the third drawer. And of course, don't forget about that hidden drawer. There are millions of ways to do bandsaw boxes. So let your imagination go wild. Uh, do something that no one else has ever done. Um, I teach a box, um, which is uh, magnetic boxes. So you can't pull the drawers open. You have to actually turn a knob to open the drawers. And then the last one I'm going to show you here, this is the one that's going up on my YouTube channel. Um, it should be up uh, within a month or so. This one is about as simple as it gets. This is what I call an apple box. It's just basically the shape of an apple. There's no way to really open the box until you do something. And that's pull that worm out. Well, here's the problem. The worm is below the lid. It doesn't come out. So there's no way to get it out unless you pull the stem off, which is a magnet, pull the worm out, slide the lid to open the box. So again, we're gonna have that up on Bandsaw Life here in the next month or so. If you'd like to learn how to make that, um, then uh, we can, uh, uh, you can learn how to do that on Bandsaw Life. Now, now, Alex, there was a great question here just a minute ago. Since you're showing the multiple drawers within drawers, et cetera, when you do that, when you do the entry cuts, do you try to offset them so that the, the distortion of the entire piece gets uh, lessened or offset? Meaning on your second drawer, do you try to do the entry cut on the opposite side of where maybe the first cut was, if that makes sense? Um, you can. Um, I have not had that issue. Um, I, I, as a matter of fact, sometimes I will take and shim a box. And that's basically hidden in the bottom. And all I did was use the same identical material so that it brings the drawer up. Um, and once you glue that into place, nobody's ever going to know that that's a false bottom. So you can kind of use that to level that drawer out. Um, folks, at, at this point in time, I'm going to tell you that we have actually changed the uh, criteria here. You are no longer restricted from unmuting yourselves. So if anyone has any questions that they would like to personally ask, I do ask that you raise your hands first so that we can uh, do this in some sense of an orderly fashion rather than just shouting over one another. But uh, if you do have a question for Alex and yourself, please feel free to raise your hand and then uh, I guess we will call on you to be allowed to add, ask it. Let me show you this real quick, Wayne. That, that's that been glued for five minutes. I will actually have to take a screwdriver to drive that apart. So you can see just how quick this stuff works. It is just absolutely the best if you're going to do small projects where you need to glue it together and it needs to be held together quickly. All right, go ahead. I can't see anybody's hand, so I can't call on anybody. I don't see any hands either. Is there anyone who has any further questions for Alex? Well, it seems that we, we, we may be, you, you must have answered everything in the bandsaw lexicon at this point in time, it seems. Oh, totally. um, I mean, it's, uh, 
it's nine o'clock here, so it's way past bourbon hour. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to ask you one because uh, because b- back to that the, the blade selection is kind of that three that three eighths three TPI is that kind of your do all type of blade that that you would use even if you were resawing something taller or would you kind of go to that uh, to to something bigger? Uh, no, I, I have I have one over my shoulder which I kind of use a. A, a three quarter two three type of, of blade when I'm going to do large resaw stuff, but that can get a little bit, you know, messy in that it leaves too much of a tooth pattern. Not only that, uh, anytime that you get over five eighths of an inch, it really is difficult to work with that blade, get it uncoiled, get it on the saw. Um, the bigger the blade, the more difficult it is to adjust. I will, uh, I'll tell you what, Wayne. You get one of those five eighths inch green wood blades for that saw that's over there over on your shoulder. And I can guarantee you, not only will you get a better result, but uh, if you don't, uh, I'll not only give you another blade, but uh, I'll, I'll use the one that you suggest. Well, well I, no, I, I'm not disagreeing with you because um, similar, sim- similar to you, I, I have multiple band saws in this shop. Um, and so uh, I, I do keep a smaller blade on another one. This this, this saw is set up for one par- purpose and one purpose alone. Uh, but like you, I've told people that you, you can set up a saw, and I generally tell them a half inch three TPI blade rather than a three eighths, but that's just a personal God recommendation. Uh, and I, I say with that, you can do almost anything. The three eighths inch, of course, will turn a little bit nicer. Um, so uh, I, I think you can set up the saw with one blade and, and do almost anything with it. I think this one's just a little easier to set up once you, well, I see it's a little easier to get it to cut straight is what I would say. It is a little more difficult to handle. I'll agree with that. Um, there is a question from, from Victor who would like to know, do any woods work any better for bandsaw boxes? Do you have a preference as to wood type? Saw. I hate to sand. Uh, <laughs> sand is a dirty four letter S word. And uh, you know, it, it, the, the softer the material, um, I, I'll tell you some of my favorites are cypress, um, cedar. Uh, the walnut is not too bad, uh, but anything that has real good figure um, and is soft. Please save save the uh, the sanding arm. Um, there was a comment that they can't could not find the six steps on your IG page. Um, oh. Is that also on your uh, Bandsaw Life page, for example, or somewhere? It be on the BandsawLife.com. Um, it, uh, and, and if not, uh, just email me uh, through bandsalllife.com or friend me on Instagram or uh, Facebook. Um, uh, Facebook, it might be full, uh, but Bandsaw Life on Facebook, it, it works as well. Um, and just, just send me a message. Uh, I promise you, I will respond. I will send it to you uh, in your email. That way you don't even have to hunt for it. But it should be in the photos of Instagram. But again, if not, just just send me a message, a uh, text or uh, email, and I will respond. There's another question of what is your opinion on extension kits for 14 inch bandsaws? Love, love, love. Um, it, you're, you're just wasting your saw's ability if you don't put it on. Uh, and the reason I say that you're losing cutting height. Um, your blade is longer, which means there's more teeth. Uh, your blade's going to last longer. Um, it, there are just so many more benefits to a riser kit than just running the saw as is. I'm going to quickly make sure I haven't missed anybody. Well, uh, while you're looking, uh, again, uh, I, I sure hope to see a lot of folks at your store uh, when we come out to do the uh 3D cutting board class. Um, again, this is we have uh, we have found that um, we've been able to get ten people through in one day to make this board, um, and 
you'll go home with an 11 by 17 board um, and something that uh, I can promise you you'd be proud of. That, that's pretty impressive. Um, and you did promise one additional thing. Could you show us how to fold a blade um, yeah. And this person specifically asks without cutting yourself. About what? I'm sorry? They ask specifically about what? Could you fold the blade without cutting yourself? Oh, sure. I, I, I hope so. I'm going to show you three ways. How's that? All right. Back this up. I'm going to raise this up so it's a little bit more of a top view. All right. Now, before we show a fold, let me show you an unfold. If you ever get a blade and it has more than three strands when you pull out of the box, don't open it in your shop. Take it outside into the grass, give it a little toss, open it up fold it down to three, and it'll make it much easier to unfold from that point. The reason we don't want to do this in the shop, if those teeth hit the floor, you bent the tooth, you've destroyed the blade. So do it in an area where you know the blade can't really get hurt. If you'll let the blade separate between your two hands, you'll notice the three strands. If you grab either the left two or right two or the left two, you'll see there's a split on the opposite side. Grab the split, let go with the other hand, slowly let it open, gives you that controlled opening every time. When you fold the blade, back edge on the floor. Don't put the teeth on the floor. Put the back edge on the floor, put it in the arch of your foot, hand palm up, twist it to you once, twice, push straight down. Perfect fold every time. Now, if you're not into bending down to the ground, Trust me, I've hurt myself before, hurt the back before, don't want to do it. Simply grab the edge of just about anything with the teeth up, about a third of the blade between your two hands with your thumbs on the teeth. Simply lift, push down with those thumbs. See how it kind of gives you that saucer? Step towards it. Blade will just about want to fold itself. After you've done that about 20 or 30,000 times, well, then you can simply take that blade and flick it, and it'll fold right up for you. Excellent. Alex, thank you so much for joining us this evening and, and helping us with, uh, or guiding us through bandsaw boxes tonight. I was just bandsaw set up in general. And I know that that is a topic that always is a popular topic when we do it within the store. And it's one that, uh, I don't want to say confounds a lot of folks, but it's always a mystery to people and is one that just, we sell a lot of bandsaws every year. We do. And it's just something that if every bandsaw came with a manual that actually explained, like you said, the six steps, we would do get a whole lot more folks doing more woodworking. And that's really the goal of this. Well, maybe we should send you some of those stickers for the, for everybody that buys one. I think we, we can probably work something out to do something like that, sir. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, the, the comments that are coming in are thank you, thank you, and this is fantastic. And I can't, I, I have, to, have to agree with that entirely. Well, I, um, I, folks, uh, I'm sorry? I appreciate the opportunity. And you and I will certainly talk sometime soon about the opportunity to come out to Colorado and uh, teach some of these folks the skills that you just talked about, as well as making those cutting boards. Um, so to the group here, I will say that we are going to come to a close here shortly. And you will remember that at the beginning of this, I pointed out that we would uh, put up a slide here to discuss how one can enter into our drawing at the end of the week. I will also ask the following, that if you do have interest in seeing Alex in person in one of our stores, please express so in, in that email so it'll give us an idea of how many of you may already have shown an interest in this. That won't be the deciding factor as to whether we bring him out or not, but it will certainly give us an idea as to that level of interest. So at the end,